Welcome to a new series here on Everyday El Dorado. I'm your host, Deanna Bond, and joining me is Suzanne Walenta. Hello. Thank Hello. you for having me. Thank you for agreeing to uh, be a guinea pig here. <laughs> guinea pigs are fun. I've never had a co-host, so this is kind of going to be exciting. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, we've done, uh, you know, guests and interviews, mm -hmm. and we've talked about mm -hmm. a lot of things, but never live. No. This is going to be fun. Yes. In this series, we will be celebrating El Dorado by turning back the clock of time on a hunt for history. I've sort of always wanted to say that. <laughs> That's a good, fun saying. Hunting history. <laughs> you know, it's because there's a History Channel show called History's Mysteries. Yes. Have you ever seen that? I don't know. I've heard of it. I don't know that I've actually watched it. Now I don't I think about it. Yeah, I don't know if I have either, but I feel like I must have at some mm -hmm. point and just don't remember it because yeah. that feeling is... Uh -huh. Histories, mysteries. So that's what we're doing. We're hunting history. Gracious, I don't know that I'm qualified to do that. <laughs> Celebrating 150 years in El Dorado is brought to you by Everyday El Dorado in conjunction with Golden Road Studios, the Butler County Historical Society, home of the Kansas Oil Museum, the City of El Dorado, and our series sponsor. Which is still open. So if you would like to sponsor uh, this series celebrating El Dorado's 150 years. Just reach out to me at everydayeldorado.com and uh, I'd love to hook you up with a sponsorship. We also have episode sponsorships available. So if you'd just like to uh, sponsor by supporting one episode or two or three, you can do that. Um, again, just reach out to me or Suzanne, the museum. Yeah, she'll put you in too. touch with me. So if I'd go on a tangent and just start talking, we'll go down rabbit holes. Yeah, that works. That's, that's fine. where you find the best stuff. That's right. Well, that's kind of how we have uncovered a lot yes. of this history. Especially this topic that we're having today, or discussing today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Truth came from be rabbit told. hole. That's right. Truth be told, we, we definitely are uncovering some new history here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to say no one has ever found it before, but they haven't published it. True. This is true. So we're kind of like... Um, venturing out into new territory. Yes. We're kind of like the archaeologists of history. There you go. So let's start. Our community is marking 150th anniversary of El Dorado's incorporation as a city of the third class, which happened on September 12th, 1871. And while September 12th is the day we officially recognize as our city's founding and will be observed by businesses, organizations and events throughout the year long celebration it was not the first time time our town was incorporated that's right el dorado was first incorporated as el dorado town company on february 6 1858 under an act by the governor and legislative assembly of the territory of kansas did you know that i actually did not that's actually really fascinating i didn't know that either that kind of makes El Dorado, one of the oldest mm -hmm. cities in this area. Yes. I mean, I need to go back and look some more, and not that we don't, you know, want to promote rivalries <laughs> <laughs> with our neighboring towns, but I know Augusta just celebrated mm -hmm. 150. Yes. Wichita is currently celebrating yes. 150. Mm -hmm. And we are beginning the celebration of our 150th year from this incorporation, mm -hmm. but it looks like it was the second incorporation yes well and I think what also ties in is fascinating when you're talking about the 1858 date uh -huh. is that this area was settled and founded through the struggle to establish Kansas as a free state and El Dorado has a rich history that has been buried and lost to the passage of time true I, I am just blown away the more I kind of learn and research and and uh, find out more and how timely that um, the struggle for free state and we have some struggles going on here in our country today mm -hmm. which kind of mirrors some of that yes i mean we're still we've made uh, a lot of strides we've come a long way since uh the pre-civil war days mm -hmm. but we still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. i think that's really interesting you know they say that the saying is uh, history repeats itself yes we're definitely seeing that here. Yes, I have to agree. This ongoing series will unearth those stories and revive the ghosts of El Dorado's past. I'm kind of excited about the yes. ghosts. I no. know, I like little mystery ghost story. Our, our cemetery tours did so well last yes, year. Yes, very well. 
The youngest soldier to fight in the Civil War, at least as far as I know. My father and I enlisted in the Union forces when I was 11 years old. I wonder if we're going to have some new ghosts to add to the uh, Perhaps. To I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. As we discover those stories, more questions are bound to arise. We do not claim to have all the answers. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I don't know it all. No, I don't either. You're in, I'm in good company. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, but what we do have is a curiosity to learn. And our goal is to continue asking questions, uh, seeking and uncovering the truth. And in addition to our topic of the week, we will also bring you a headline from the past taken from our historic paper. This may be one of my favorite segments. Um, as a journalist, something very interesting to me is that the newspaper I write for has been a pillar of our community since its inception. So the first issue of the Walnut Valley Times was published on March 4th, 1870. Wow, that is amazing. That is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. That is. That first issue was published by T.B. Murdoch and J.S. Danford. So J.S. Danford didn't stay with the Walnut Valley Times for long, mm -hmm. and T.B. Murdoch became the sole proprietor um, in those early years, but through mergers later on with the El Dorado Republican and eventually the Augusta Gazette, the name has changed but remains in operation, as we know it today, the Butler County Times Gazette. Nice. Yeah. So that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. I don't know. I thought it was a great tie-in. Yeah, that was a great tie-in. So, uh, so let's see what was happening. So this episode is mm -hmm. planned. Let's hope everything goes according to plan. To air on September 9th. So if uh, it all works out, this will be airing then. So we're going to take a look at what was in the papers on uh, September 9th, 1870. All right. So in 1870, it was an election year, which echoes this year just as well. And on page one, in addition to many advertisements, was a discussion on the upcoming vote on the hedge law. What is a hedge law? You know, that's a good question. But what I think it is, so we'll just talk it out here, mm -hmm. and this is one of my um, kind of goals with this mm -hmm. podcast and, and why I asked you to join me, is, um, you know, we don't always know everything. Yeah. But we have the tools available mm -hmm. to help us. And, and what, what I've been learning, and, and you as well through um, our research, is that earlier researchers and historians didn't have the same advantages to technology Very that true. we do. Mm -hmm. So we can open up the interwebs and, and kind of search through old newspapers mm -hmm. and, and reports and records and files and, and kind of find those primary sources yes. that, uh, that some of the earlier historians couldn't. Very true. So, um, what I know of Hedge Law is that um, in the early years, Kansas, it was wide open prairie. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the settlers came in and they established their claims. And uh, some people felt like fencing in the land was mm -hmm. probably not a good idea. And uh, other people said, it's a great idea. We don't want our cattle roaming off or our pigs down the street or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, and and um, using trees, tree lines, to be a natural hedge, oh, a natural mm -hmm. boundary, also kind of protect helped with the elements. Yeah. So this is what I unofficially know. I'm not. Hey, that sounds like a good answer. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a rancher. <laughs> but so the way I like to go about learning things is if I don't know them, I kind of just propose a theory mm -hmm. based sometimes on maybe what I've gleaned mm -hmm. or what I've been told by someone else, even if it's not true. Sure. It's fine. Got to start somewhere. Got to have a theory. Even a if it's a hypothesis. A conspiracy theory? A conspiracy theory works too. <laughs> we like those. So uh, would this be a good example of what somebody could come and come to the museum and look at our mi newspapers on microfilm? If you're really fascinated about learning more about the hedge law, mm -hmm. you can come use our microfilm. So let's see, on page two. So on page two, I thought it was, I guess I wasn't even aware of kind of what was going on at mm -hmm. the time when, and, you know, when we first pulled this up and the, the war with the French, uh, oh yes, the French, Napoleon. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. Let's see. So it was talking about the downfall of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is rich with really great history. Mm -hmm. So students doing kind of papers, yes, research articles, history, and it helps to understand other events and how they're all occurring. What events are occurring at different times and the same 
same year and nationally, internationally, and have a context for the world as itself. Yes, and 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 to see also how local citizens what they thought, you yes. know, because oh, there was sure. even letters to the editor in ah, here. Ah, so there is there local Butler County citizens are talking about the war. Well, let's see. This one is uh, correspondence to the Times. Here they're just being proud of the newspaper. Ah, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with that. El Dorado deserves <laughs> a good paper, is what he says. Um, no, this is. Let's see. This. I, I'm just seeing facts so um, reporters at the time they didn't have bylines mm, so you had okay. an editor his name was on the paper he would have reporters who would give him information or citizens would come in and drop off things or write letters and they would just publish that oh. without attributing it unless it was a letter signed by mm -hmm. a citizen that they wanted um, wanted that notice I guess that's interesting so, like, for instance, um, this is just saying uh, the Germans of Atchison fired a salute day before yesterday in honor of the late Prussian victories. Hmm. That's interesting. So the Germans in Atchison were proud of their ancestors. Yeah. Or some of them maybe still had family. It's very possible. Come to think of it, I think I had a great-grandfather fighting on the German side at that time. Huh. See, now I want to go search my genealogy. <laughs> All the rabbit holes we can go down. All yes. right, we need to move on with our, <laughs> with our podcast because I, I will have a tendency to go down all the rabbit holes. Should we move to page three and talk yeah. about town? And something You have mentioned something about town and country. Oh, what yes. What did you find about town and country? This, this has got to be one of my favorite sections of the newspaper because, you know, uh, there's so many interesting things that you can find about mm -hmm. it. You can find out kind of the daily gossip, I guess. Ah, of sure. What's going on. But really interesting facts. Um, let's see, so in our um, in our paper on September 9th, 1870, just one of the little, so it's really interesting the things that they think cover as news. Sure. So, cool nights. That's it. Just says, we're having cool, cool nights. nights. That's yeah. all it says. Ple weather pleasant. Hmm. So the weather must be very pleasant. It's September though. We usually have pleasant weather. September is a nice month in Kansas. Crops are yielding largely. That's positive. Yeah. Quails may be killed after October 1st. Ah. So, so now we've got kind of like a hunting and fishing mm -hmm. um, times. I don't know. There's a word for that when, when you can go and fish or you sure. know, hunt. You have to have yeah. a license and that has to be the time. Like if you're going turkey hunting mm -hmm. or it has to be season. Yes, season. Yes. I'm not a hunter, so I'm sorry I can't help you on those yep. terms. Same. Same. But apparently you can shoot quails after October 1st. Good to know. In 1870. Uh, so let's just scroll down a little bit further. Um, so one, our streets last Saturday looked more animated than usual. I went, they don't say why? Well, I'm thinking Saturday night, uh, the farmers and families oh. were coming into town, maybe doing their shopping, uh -huh. getting things before Sunday church, maybe. Oh, that's a you good... Know, that's a good theory. Talking. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't personally know anybody that was alive. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have any insight. I, well, but well, I just... Well, a personal insight. Well, yeah. You yeah. have insight. Sorry. I apologize. No. You have insight. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I do I do have some friends that are of an, a much earlier generation. Sure. And uh, even by the, the 30s, mm -hmm. it was still common for, for families and farmers and everybody to come into the downtown area mm -hmm. and... Uh, to to do the shopping, go mm -hmm. to the show if there was one. I guess we didn't have theater that early. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, just kind of gather and talk and mm -hmm. shop and that kind of thing. So it was kind of the the night. Yeah. At that I time. That. Yeah. So I'm thinking that that must have been it. Uh, let's see what else we got. So then we get down and it actually starts talking about people. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, Professor Wilson and family are in town. He reports lively times in Cowley with interesting immigration. Hmm. So that's, you know, something when, when people would come and visit, they would often put a note in there, so-and-so uh -huh. was in town to visit, or visiting family, or comes from another town. And sometimes uh -huh. it's just a little, you think it seems inconsequential, but when you're researching and looking for clues, sure. sometimes that little bit can point you off into another direction. That's true. Kind of give you a little, a little hint. So. Here's one that says, um, 
T.B. Murdoch, the editor of this oh. paper, was elected a delegate to the state convention and is therefore absent this week. Oh, cool. So he had someone kind of work in the paper for him. Yeah. So we don't know who they didn't, but so we know that the editor of the paper was elected a delegate from the state convention. We know that that was an election year. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that just some really great, great things. But aside from that, so many advertisements. Oh, I and, know. And um, I love ads from the old newspapers. Oh. And, I mean, it is a majority of ads because Mm -hmm. uh, the newspaper was not only letting the rest of the world know what was Mm -hmm. going on in El Dorado, but it was to entice people to come and be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, so there's a lot of, a lot of great advertisements, but just snuck in over here Mm -hmm. between the advertisements and the town and country is a, is a story, but I think it reads more like an ad. Mm -hmm. And it says, the Southern Kansas Stage Company have put on four horse coaches between El Dorado and Emporia. Ah. The travel has been so great over this popular line that it has become a necessity. The company is sparing no pains to make it both pleasant and comfortable for passengers. William Brooks, who drives on this end of the route, is one of the most experienced drivers in the West. Travelers can ride with safety while under his care. Considering the beautiful scenery, comfortable coaches, fast time, safety, and the courteous treatment of this line, we would recommend the Southern Kansas Stage Company to travelers. So it's an endorsement from the yes. paper. Yeah. It's kind of like early day influencers. Mm-hmm. Oh, good comparison. I like that. Yeah. But. So why this stuck out to me is because of our our little field trip there. Yes, that was exciting, that was fun. And I'm pretty sure that we will have an episode um, talking about that kind Mm -hmm. of a little bit later, but briefly, Suzanne went on a a hunt for history with me. We did, yes, it was pretty fun. Yeah, Yeah. and we, what we got to see were some of the ruts from Mm -hmm. this, this trail. Yes, yeah. I never knew it even existed in El Dorado. Yes, when we were actually in talk about rabbit holes, we were actually at the plan, uh, city planners department, engineering department, I'm sorry, looking at maps, and he happened to mention that there were still uh, trail ruts from a, the stagecoach line coming from Emporia, and he mentioned they were at the golf course, and knew pretty much what hole they were located on. So we decided to switch up our research for the afternoon and head to the golf course and find these trail ruts. I think it's just amazing that nobody, they're playing golf all day long and they have no idea that what they're playing golf on top of. How many people have we talked to today didn't know it was here? Oh man, at least five in the past hour. At least everyone we've talked to At least here. everyone we've talked to, yes. No one here, so no one here. Scott told us about it. Scott, yep, Scott said he told us about it. So I'm trying to figure out, so if it goes up and down like this, mm-hmm. are the wagons, yeah. yeah, you have two. So you have a wagon here and a wagon trail there. Because this is going to have to go, it's coming up above. It's going to hit underneath. Under the wagon. Carriage. Yeah, they got the wheels on both sides here. Yeah. And then you've got it here. Yeah, it was It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. So that led us down a whole nother rabbit hole. Yes. But it kind of all ties in mm-hmm. because that trail, um, and you know, in our in our later episode, that trail maybe wasn't the trail taken to find El Dorado, right. but it was definitely taken by uh, later travelers and immigrants coming to mm-hmm. El Dorado and, yeah. and on to Wichita then. And is the, like you mentioned, the trail route that is mentioned in this paper in 1870 is the trail route there, 1870, 1871. Mm-hmm. So it definitely helps as, again, this would count as a primary source mm-hmm. to help establish the timeline for that. Yep, it would. Verify, verify those details. So a lot of great, a lot of great uh, clues and things when you're looking at a paper, and maybe, maybe you kind of get on a hit that there's, you know, what you're looking for might be in there. Go ahead and read the paper. Yes. You know, look at the articles around it. Uh, check all the pages, even if you, you know, were like, mm, I don't have time to read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I would suggest, you know, skim through it at least because you'd be surprised at what little hidden gems. It really is a treasure hunt. It is. No, it is a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. 
So we've learned there are so many interesting things to learn by just opening up a newspaper. This is very true. Yes. So before we move on to today's topic, uh, let's take a moment to identify our sponsors. Today's episode, ready for a mouthful? I'm ready. The first, documenting history and the veracity of the tales were told. That is a mouthful. Do we, couldn't we come up with a easier no. title? Mm -mm. We like to do things yes. the hard way. I Clearly. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Everyday El Dorado, the Butler County Historical Society, home of the Kansas Oil Museum, the city of El Dorado, and supporters like you. Perhaps no truer words can be said by the history of our town than those written in the historical atlas of Butler County, Kansas. Quote, I am fully aware of one fact, and that, that is that you might call on different ones to write up the history of Butler County and the recollections about the first settlers. We materially disagree, at least in some particulars. Suffice to say, in the beginning, I mean the beginning of the settlement of Butler County, William Hildebrand and Bob DeRacken and others too numerous to mention came to El Dorado, Butler County, and made a settlement. And we are glad they did come and held that the first until we all came. And we are all here for better or worse at least a very large majority of us are happy because we are here, fully believing it is for the better that we are so situated. That's really beautiful. Yes. Flowing prose. It is. Very descriptive. And, you know, he gave us a couple of names of early settlers yes. and glossed over the others too numerous to mention. Yes. But I think it is a challenge that I am ready to accept to see if we can find out who those absolutely who those were. Yes. Want to find them out. But when uh, I was looking to kind of identify uh -huh. some of that and the genesis of some of these stories that we accept as fact, like the story here of William Hildebrand and Bob Durakin being early settlers. Uh -huh. Um, it appears that some of it may not have been recorded accurately. Really? I know, right? Because huh. we pretty much think that if it's in the history books, it's true. Yes. Especially a larger published volume. It's been cited quite a bit. Yes. By all the historians that come after. Yes. And that's sort of the case that I'm finding with uh, the history of Kansas. So we have this... Uh, two volume set back here uh, by William Cutler. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes called Andreas's History of Kansas because Andreas was the uh, publisher. Yes, that's correct, he was the publisher. But so we'd like to give credit to the author, mm -hmm. Cutler. And uh, you know, it's just kind of a little, little side note. What I'm realizing is maybe Cutler was not really an author, he was more of a assimilator. Yeah. Compi compi compiler compiled all the all the facts and stories from each county mm -hmm. that he went to, to and put them together. So, and that kind of makes me wonder if he even visited, uh, if he actually oh, came here himself, question. or yes. if he sent a letter and said, "Hey, hmm. send us back some deets." Yeah, probably. Yeah, because I don't. That would take, especially in the what he what he wrote in the eighteen eighties. Mm -hmm. That would take a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. to go from county to county, from town to town. Yeah, most likely he was writing letters. Mm -hmm. So so I guess that's something I just, you know, that we can think about as we go along here, mm -hmm. that um, as a result of that way that he gathered information and then published it as, as though it were all fact, and I'm sure a great deal of it is mm -hmm. true and factual. Just we're finding some of it's not. Um, but as, as a result, early historians and documenter, documentarians and historians uh, who have meticulously researched using that information mm -hmm. ended up perpetuating some of those inaccuracies. Yes, that is very true. And, and that makes it um, a little hard to tell the story. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> yes, if you have to start questioning your sources, mm -hmm. it can make telling the story a little more intricate. Mm -hmm. 
and and the story we're going to share with you today is um, is one that if I question that one now I want to question all of them yes yes and and I'm a questioner well and that's a good segue mm-hmm. because in Cutler's book mm-hmm. he writes about the first celebration of the fourth of July mm-hmm. so the first can quote I should start the first celebration in this county of our national holiday took place long before Butler was a county or Kansas a territory. In July 1847, Captain J.J. Clark, with his company of Missouri Mounted Volunteers, bound for the Mexican War, came along the Old California Trail. In crossing the Walnut, about a mile below the site of El Dorado, on the evening of the 3rd, camped overnight. The following day, the eagle screamed and salutes were fired and do honors pay to the warriors of an older day, end quote. I said third, I think they mean third instant. It says 3D. Mm-hmm. And then we, the we decided it means like yeah, the third the day. the night of the third. The night of the mm-hmm. third. Yeah, okay. like July 3rd. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the but, eagle screamed. I know, that's it, that's one of my, um, I had a giggle a little bit. That, that's a, quite the descriptor. You like that? Yes, it's very screamed. poetic. Yeah, it really is. But is it true? Right. Disregard the ding dong yeah. in the background. Disregard the blonde <laughs> ding dong over here. Mm-hmm. Did I, an eagle really scream? I mean, so here's the thing: eagles fly. They do. They do sometimes scream. They do. When they, you know. And we do have eagles in Kansas. We do. Uh, have but you was, ever seen a bald eagle in Butler County? I have once, mm-hmm. and I feel like I was out at the lake mm-hmm. flying. That. It wasn't like stopped and waiting for me, and it wasn't screaming, but you know, <laughs> that was it. Um, I have so many questions, but let's just follow, let's just follow the the research here. Yes. What what we did. Um, this appears to be the first mention of the first Fourth of July celebration in Butler County. Cutler does not cite where he learned of this story. Uh, he does, however, identify information from the county's early settlement and that it was carefully compiled from the recollections of Martin Vaught, J.D. Connor, and D.M. Bronson, and from data in their possession. So probably notes, some uh-huh. of them had been maybe county commissioner yes. and had their yes. notes with them. Uh-huh. Uh, Cutler then boldly makes a statement, which implies that the information he presents is the most accurate and more believable than any other historical document stating, quote, it will be found to differ considerably from the matter found in the report of the state of agriculture into which numerous errors had crept, either through lack of care on the part of the correspondent or unavoidable typographic mistakes. End quote. Cutler's account has then thus therefore been recounted by later historians because he established himself as the expert on this mm-hmm. film. He's did. like, because I say so. Right. In fact, everybody else who said so is just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the History of Butler County by Mooney, he, Mooney writes, The 4th of July, the very first celebration of this national holiday in this county happened, it is recorded, long before Butler was a county or a Kansas territory. Cutler, in his history of Kansas, says, and then he goes on to repeat what we've already spoken about, about what Cutler's saying about the 4th of July, and that our eagles screaming and our salutes being fired. So this is a great example of another historian, not too long after Cutler, reiterating the same story. Mm -hmm. Word for word. Word for word. And using Cutler... As the primary source. Mm-hmm. So we're still pretty, pretty, pretty certain that Cutler's the genesis of this yes. so far. Yes. Um, in the foreword of his book, Mooney begins, Histories are as perfect as historian is wise and is gifted with the eye of a soul. And he was quoting Carlyle. That's good. Quote. I think that's beautiful. It is really pretty. Yeah, and it's true. Because... We're, no one's perfect. No. No, I don't even claim to be perfect here. No. Mm-mm. I'm by far. But I'm a questioner. I got lots of questions. Yeah. And I got an internet at my fingers. So. Pretty powerful tool. Yeah. 
So I don't think that, that maybe some of these histories were, were just passed along. They were intending to fool people. Or, no, it was not their intent. No. I think they just knew them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, before we go on here, something that we had talked about in this research was that Cutler had written this or compiled this history after 1876. Yes, which happens to be the 100th mm -hmm. birthday of our, of our nation. Yes. And, you know, it was interesting because also when going through our Butler County mm -hmm. history of that time, you found some really interesting things. Yes, there was quite a few. There was a call in the local paper, Walnut Valley Times, um, asking people to help create the narrative so that they could, as a county, participate in the centennial. So um, very much a finding that patriot angle to the story mm -hmm. and I don't wonder it was a question I don't have any basis other than a question if some of that didn't help embellish a story to try to find a story where maybe there wasn't one mm -hmm. or to add on to pieces to help show that importance mm -hmm. and I, I think we're probably gonna maybe see a lot of that oh yes I agree just from you know what we've what we've done all, already so in in Mooney's book he, he continues the contributors of this work so this is Mooney's book that he's talking about mm -hmm. uh, the contributors of this work the historians are men and women writing from personal knowledge personal observation and personal experience those that have made created and assisted in making and creating that of which they write so poetic mm -hmm. but I, I digress I'm still in the middle of the quote <laughs> uh, that they are wise and gifted and endowed with and possessed of both mind and soul is self-evident fact and the reader will be convinced that they speak that which they do know mm -hmm. this history being based upon such evidence which becomes the best evidence attainable its perfection and its authenticity assured. I mean, that's great. No, it's he's a well written. He's a well written author. As I step over my own words, mm -hmm. I do not have the same eloquence. No, same. <laughs> but uh, who's going to argue with Judge Mooney's eloquently articulated oh, history? No, what he's putting out's got to be fact. Then yes. But, you know, I wonder, where did he get his information? Mm -hmm. for? And it's not just this story, but his whole book, which now I, I think everything is suspect until I find a primary sure. source. No, absolutely. Which is just kind of the theory I have to go mm -hmm. on, even if it is true. Right. Uh, Mooney ends his foreword with, quote, recognition is made of the following bibliography used in the preparation of this book. Kansas State Historical Le Collection, Wilder's Annals of Kansas, Kansas in American Commonwealths by Levitt, Leverett W. Spring, History of Kansas by William C. Cutler, Cyclopedia of State, F.W. Blackmar, Kansas Session Laws, Bulletins, Pamphlets, Records, etc. End quote. And so I, I like that, that he, he's got such a broad... Uh, array of sources not just yes. books but he actually went to laws mm -hmm. and um, um, court records which we're attempting we're attempting it's a journey yeah it's you know open public records open records mm -hmm. you know would, would you would think then that you would have access to these things yes just trying to find them yes we are not giving up though no um, yeah, so, so again, you know, he just kind of lays out the case mm -hmm. for his book is, is a definitive source. Yes. And, uh, to be trusted and believed and history. Mm hmm But he shared that same story. Yes. That he Once got again, from, yeah. yeah. Which is, it's interesting. Well, and another historian that, um, repeats the story is Jessie Perry Stratford. Who I love. Yes, she's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And so in her book, Butler County's 80 Years, 1855 to 1935, she writes, What is said to be the first 4th of July celebrated in Butler County was in 1847, when Captain J.J. Clark with a company of Missouri volunteers rode over the Osage Trail to take part in the Mexican War. 
His company arrived on the hill above the Walnut and camped July 3rd at the old Osage Trail crossing, about a mile and a half south of the business center of the present El Dorado. Now she's now inserted some more details. Some more detail. The following morning, they fired a salute in honor of the day, mounted their horses, and rode away. The record of this early celebration is found in Captain Clark's diary. End quote. But where does she find this information? Where does she does she cite that information? Jessie Perry Stratford does say in her book that she gathered her information. Um, open quote. In the preparation of this book, material has been borrowed from Judge Volney Mooney, Matchless History of Butler County, published 18 years ago. And no, when she's saying 18 years ago, she's talking about when she's writing. From 1935. From 1935. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Andreas's History of Kansas, Blackmore's Encyclopedia of Kansas History, and Russell H. Fisher's excellent book, Biographical Sketches of El Dorado Citizens. The compilation, or end quote, I'm sorry, end quote. The compilation of Butler County's 80 years was suggested by Judge Mooney, who generously volunteered permission to use his book to any extent it desired. So she, obviously Judge Mooney is still alive at this mm -hmm. point and was um, encouraging her to probably update mm -hmm. some Butler County history because what his was published in 1890s? I have to do the math now. 18 years prior to 35. Eight, yeah, that's true. So what is that? 15, 17? Yeah, 19, yeah 17? 17, 17. Oh, that's an interesting yeah, time frame. Yeah, that is an it? interesting time frame. Right after oil. Yes. And, yeah. Interesting. So a lot has happened A since. lot is happening. So he was probably <clears> trying to get her to kind of go into a little more detail about what had occurred since. Mm -hmm. And so she does, she does, I say, cite her works and she yes. cites. So it's, I think it's pretty fair to say that, that when she retells this story, she is just retelling it from Cutler and, and Mooney's. Yes. Um, she's added a few things, but it just seems like her own artistic uh, flair. Mm -hmm. You know, she adds the downtown district, which, you know, has grown clearly yes. by 35. So it is a booming mm -hmm. district. Um, and you know, but what I found interesting is the first time we ever read the uh, the fact that J.J. Clark, Captain Clark, had a diary yes. that this information came yes, from. Yes, because you had two prior that we've mentioned who mm -hmm. didn't mention a diary at all. Yeah, so that's that's something that mm -hmm. you know I so I go looking. Yes, and, absolutely. And uh, you know, I, I looked quite a bit <laughs> for stuff first, kind of tracking down these other historians yes. that are referenced mm -hmm. and uh one of them then is fisher which she uh she alludes to his biographical sketches mm -hmm. of el dorado and we that is here at the museum yes it is and it's really good because it was a con it was written at a time he wrote about contemporary so people who were living at yes. the time or who were alive and were able to kind of pass down these yes. oral stories yes so there's a lot of great it's a great resource definitely now you know that's up to date as of 1935. Correct. So yes. if you're looking for some older information on mm -hmm. families or, or uh, citizens, you know. It can it, give you some clues. For definitely, sure. definitely. Uh, but Fisher, then when he's writing in reference to the celebration held on July 4, 1857, he writes in reference to a celebration that was actually held on July 4th, 1857 mm -hmm. so we'll probably cover that at a later date but that in in he was speaking about that specific celebration he says it's of interest that this actually was not the first independence day celebration near what is now el dorado that distinction falls to a band of missourians who under captain jj clark were crossing kansas in 1847 on route to texas and service in the mexican war they were following the old California Trail and crossed the Walnut about one mile below the present city in the early evening of July 3rd and camped on the West Bank. The next day, they paused long enough to fire salutes, pay proper tribute to the valor of the soldiers of the Revolution, and otherwise observe the national holiday. However, with the aid of technology uh, and resources previously unavailable yes. to you know earlier historians just i always want to make sure that i kind of insert that i yes. you know we're just really blessed and fortunate mm -hmm. to have access to so much information yes and very quickly i mean even what not even 20 years ago doing genealogy 
it could take you years just to find one ancestor. Mm -hmm. We're so we are very blessed. Yes. Yeah. Just open the computer and yes. if you know what keywords to use and what resources to mm -hmm. to go to, you can find a yeah. lot. Okay. I'd say just about anything. Yes. It's true. Just about. Uh, let's see. I spent a long time looking for <laughs> Captain JJ Clark. We did. We did. We did. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say how long because usually I can find people, but mm -hmm. JJ Clark was eluding me. Mm -hmm. Even with all the information yes. we were given, he was a, a Missourian. Captain. Yeah. He, he was, was a captain. Yes. He was in the Mexican War. Which is all details that should be very, not very, easier to track because yeah. military does keep really good records. It will help to kind of triangulate. Yes. Narrow down. Yes. Uh, but then one day, Suzanne says, Look what I found. It was an exciting day. I was super excited to find it. I was super it was excited cool. too. Because we finally kind of found a missing puzzle piece. And I want to say I was looking for something else. Mm -hmm. And happened to find... I Don't um, don't quote me on that, but I feel like I was. And another plug for why to read mm -hmm. the surrounding Everything. things. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So the article I found was actually published Friday, August 4th. 4th excuse me. 1876 in the Walnut Valley Times and it's probably the actual genesis of the story that we hear about JJ Clark the 4th of July the Missouri team and this was in 1876 1876 was this article this one month after one, our 100 mm -hmm. and it was a small tiny little yeah it's your app yeah it was right after the hundred so mm -hmm. we, there we go back tying into the anniversary of the nation and what was going on in, was as a context as mm -hmm. a national and local and what people were tr excited about mm -hmm. so this article open quote butler county in 1847 captain jj clarkson jj clarkson's company of missouri mounted volunteers enlisted for the mexican war marched from greenfield missouri colonel john rawls for whom rawls county was named commanding crossed the walnut river on the old california trail running through butler county and crossing Walnut River of mile below El Dorado on the fourth day of July, 1847. And after crossing said stream, went into camp and proceeded to celebrate the fourth in a patriotic and becoming manner. Mm -hmm. Elder J. W. Campbell, now a citizen of Rock Creek, Butler County, was a private in the Captain Clarkson's company and participated in said celebration. This was the first celebration of the kind in the county, if not the state. This bit of history is furnished to Captain Miller by Elder Campbell and is certainly worth preserving. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Some stuff. Yes. Yeah. We got a, a, a few more details. Yeah, because now it appears that Captain Clarkson was name was originally identified as Clark in Cutler's account. So kind of just... Mm -hmm. It got something maybe got changed, something dropped, not, probably not intentionally. Right. It just it Oral tradition. Oral tradition. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only error that to be found when mm -hmm. we review all this information. Mm -hmm. Stratford noted the information on this first celebration came from Captain Clark's diary. Well, there probably is not a diary. Because there's not a Captain Clark. Because there's not a Captain Clark. So it appears mm -hmm. that um, an assumption was made by Stratford mm -hmm. as there, there is no mention of a diary previously. Mm -hmm. No one else talks uh -huh. about it. Now, subsequently, histories that then cite Stratford have included that. Yes. And that's just kind of the unfortunate uh, thing that happens when, you know, things are not documented correctly. Uh -huh. um, you know, and think, you know, we understand oral traditions and, and just kind of passing on what you got from someone else and that yes. happens, but then it enters the you know, the uh, public mm -hmm. forum. Yes. Um, and, and in this case, uh, there was a, a school teacher, mm -hmm. a local school teacher, somewhere shortly after 35, about that time, um, had written a, a book mm -hmm. on the story of El Dorado and included different stories that um, either that she took from, from other sources like Stratford um, or oral mm -hmm. stories or stories she'd been told by her grandma and, uh, and, and compiled them into a, a book mm -hmm. that was then, um, I want to say, I don't, 
accepted by the superintendent of schools, but definitely um, approved. Approved, yeah. Put a stamp on it. Mm -hmm. He gave a forward to it mm -hmm. and, um, and, and recommended that the book go into all the local schools, mm -hmm. that all the children should be able to read this, this really great history of El Dorado. And, um, and the fact is, it's a storybook. It, yes. It, it's definitely, yes. you know, has some basis in fact, you can, you know, uh, and, and not from the writer's fault. She no. actually researched. Absolutely. But, and told the story verbatim mm -hmm. from, yes. from Stratford. Mm -hmm. So now we have a whole generation or generations of local El Dorado mm -hmm. students, maybe, who are learning this story that's not even true. Yes. Now we can see how we go down the rabbit hole of what yes. else have we What been... else has been, yeah, what else have we been taught? <laughs> oh, that's another episode. <laughs> yes. yes, that would go on forever. Oh, goodness. So uh, let's see if we can find where Campbell and Clark, or Clarkson, uh, served together in the Mexican War. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We hope you're enjoying today's episode, and we would love to hear your thoughts and any questions that you may have. If you would just leave a comment at the Everyday El Dorado Facebook page, and uh, perhaps we could answer your questions in one of our upcoming episodes. That would be great. That would be kind of cool. Kind of like a mailbag. Yes. Oh, and while you're at it, please subscribe to the podcast, and you will be notified when we have new shows coming out. We would love to uh, bring you along with, this, with us on this journey. I'm pretty excited about it. While we're celebrating 150 years in El Dorado, why would you want to live anywhere else? Good I question. <laughs> and now back to our show. A review of the Missouri Digital Heritage Archive, Soldiers' Records, War of 1812 to World War I, verify J.W. Campbell's service in the Mexican War with the 3rd Regiment Missouri Mounted Volunteers Company C, and Captain James J. Clarkson's service with the Mexican War with the 3rd Regiment, Missouri Mounted Volunteers, Company F. Hmm. Records for both men show they enrolled for service in Greenfield, Missouri, mm. mm -hmm. and Campbell enrolled on April 25th, 1847, and Clarkson enrolled on April 26th. 1847, and both men mustered into service on June 11, 1847, in Independence, Missouri. So uh, I think it's pr highly probable, yes. as Ken says. Yes. Ninety-seven percent likely. <laughs> but we need to leave the door open in yes, case we're wrong. Yes. Uh, probable though that that both men knew each other. Yes. Uh, enrolled. Uh, in Greenfield, Missouri, and our, our original newspaper article talks about that, that they marched from Greenfield. Mm -hmm. So it does. so it's likely that, that they knew each other. That leads cre lends credence to the fact that that newspaper article is probably the genesis for this story. Yes. And to kind of reiterate, I'm a timeline person, mm -hmm. so to kind of just review and reiterate a timeline, mm -hmm. um, the article we were talking about with Campbell mm -hmm. was 1876, mm -hmm. Cutler is 1883, Mooney is 1917, and then we have Jesse Perry Stratford in 1935. So just to remember, as we're piecing this through together, this Campbell, the small little news article, was the very first, mm -hmm. as you said, the genesis of the story, just to help kind of keep that timeline. There's a lot of stuff that kind of gets can get jumbled, but... Yeah, yeah. and poor, poor Campbell is never mentioned again. No, he's never mentioned... Yeah. Captain J.J. Clark is the hero of the show. Yeah. Didn't even get his name right. No, and Campbell is a, a, res a long-term resident of Butler County, and mm -hmm. he's never really mentioned again, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Yeah. It's too so another timeline date, as we rewind even further back. So following the start of the Mexican War in 1846, America's Army of the West followed the Santa Fe Trail westward to successfully invade Mexico. Colonel Alexander Donovan's First Regiment Missouri Mounted Volunteers mustered at Fort Leavenworth in June of 1846. And from there, under the command of General Kearney, marched to Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot about uh, Donovan and his march because it's been very well documented. Yes. Um, and we know that he took the route, yes. uh, the Santa Fe route, which is which is another part of this, this story 
a couple different stories uh, say that the stories say either that that uh, Clarkson mm -hmm. Clark and uh, his company crossed um, in El Dorado on their way to the Mexican War, and that kind of doesn't fit with the way the the uh, military was was transporting, and so that was kind of a little flag for me. But uh, you know, um, we're not that far off the Santa Fe, right? But then sometimes maybe people would have alluded to the roads that came through El Dorado mm -hmm. as the Santa Fe because it kind of took you up to the mm -hmm. Santa Fe or um, sometimes it's been called the California the Ar Arkansas because mm -hmm. it came from Arkansas up to the California but one of the stories said it was the Osage Trail yes which while the Osage Trail and the California Arkansas trails do come through here they do. Um, it was probably not traveled by the Missouri Mounted Volunteers no. on the way to the Mexican War. No, because um, there was a resource that you found, a thesis paper mm -hmm. presented to the faculty of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College by a Major Patrick Naughton Jr. In his paper, he states, the easiest route to the west from Missouri was to travel the already established Santa Fe Trail. This would take the army through the Mexican territory of New Mexico to its capital, Santa Fe. So that reiterates what you're saying is that even from Missouri, the easiest path west and then down to New Mexico would have been the Santa Fe. It's a heavily traveled trail. It's well known by the military. It's most That is most likely the route they would have taken. It would, sure. it would most likely not have diverted off of it. Sure. Um, but, you know, one of the, uh, one of the I guess rebuttals or, or just questions that uh, Ken, and when, when we mentioned Ken, we're talking about Ken Spurgeon. Yes. He's the consultant here, mm -hmm. the historical consultant at the museum. He's also a professor. Um, and, and, you know, he kind of uh, suggested it's possible that some of those um, companies might have taken a different route. Mm -hmm. Maybe they came across from Missouri and came across and, and maybe could have, could have come sure. through here and then maybe up to the Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's that's possible. Uh, however, when we looked at, um, and, and I think we'll probably get to that here in a bit, when we looked at uh, their service records and they enrolled in Greenfield and marched to Independence, yes. where they mustered in, and then her, their service records indicate that from Independence... And when you say Independence, you mean Independence, Independence, Missouri. Missouri, not Kansas. Correct, correct. Independence, Missouri, and then they, they went to Leavenworth. Yes. And so their, their service records tell us that, and um, it's, it, it makes more sense that that is the way they went, mm -hmm. which it does take them not by way of El Dorado. Correct. But, you know, we got to leave that, that, that door open, 97% yes. possible. Yes. You never know what those possibilities could be. There could be something else. That's right. So we're going to kind of leave that open. So I took that challenge from Ken to heart, and I went looking for some more information because, um, you know that's kind of where we were at at that point in the research we we knew that that it was captain clark and we knew that it was um C private campbell and that while they were in different companies they were in the same regiment it was likely those companies traveled together but again i didn't have that proof exactly uh so i'm still looking for some more some more uh, information on that so i kept looking so glad i did yes uh Philip Gooch Ferguson is a private in the 3rd Regiment Missouri Mounted Volunteers, and he was in Company D, so another company. Uh, he was an editor for the Miner's Prospect in Potosi, Missouri. So this was prior to him volunteering for uh, service to mm -hmm. go to war, and he was resolved and uh, to document his time at war because as a writer and editor that would be something that would be fascinating to him and and even at the beginning of his diary he had uh, at, the, at the beginning of his journal book he said um, you know if, if I make it out of here alive I want to be able to share my stories oh. so you know he he really was passionate about sharing mm -hmm. information and uh, and so that's what he said about doing so he started documenting from the time of his uh, in, enlistment there in Potosi and um and the way that counties got together and they um you know got enough men together to make a company and then they headed up uh -huh. they were all headed up to independence missouri um so so this is where he started and um so i got to reading through his his diary mm -hmm. and his his diary was eventually given to the missouri historical society which is why we have access to that today mm -hmm. so our earlier historians would not have 
have had access to that diary. This is not at all um, what Jesse Perry Stratford was referencing. No. Um, just so to clear any confusion mm -hmm. up. Um, but it, it gives us a a better picture kind yes. of of what was happening um and so the missouri historical society missouri has open records act so they mm -hmm. they have a lot of their records also online digitally mm -hmm. so if you are looking for information about ancestors or relatives or events that occurred in missouri um it take a little digging but you can find it it's absolutely available um, so that's where I went and I got to read through and it's just handwritten. So it wasn't transcribed. It is scanned in there. And I love reading that again, primary sources. Um, and he, he documents on July 3rd where they were. So this is the third oh. regiment of the Missouri Mounted Volunteers, which is again, Clarkson's regiment, Clarkson's there, Campbell's, Campbell's there, Campbell's there. And so now is uh, private Ferguson who, uh, got promoted because they realized he was a newspaper editor and a writer, and they made him company clerk, which probably aided his ability to kind of stay alive. Oh, absolutely, yes. You know, he wasn't like right out there. Yes. Uh, but he was, he was in it. So he writes, July 3rd, left Independence for Fort Leavenworth. Hmm. So they were in Independence on July 3rd. Mm -hmm. And our original story, kind of coming all the way back to this, was the first, uh, 4th of July in mm -hmm. Butler County occurred when this group of volunteers from Missouri were on their way to the Mexican War and they stopped on the 3rd uh, as they crossed the Walnut in just uh, here El Dorado, just a little below El Dorado. And so, uh, so he writes, on July 4th, today we crossed the Kansas, a clear, beautiful stream in which a number of us took a bath which was very refreshing after the fatigues of the day. After crossing, they set up camp, which was only about four or five miles from Fort Leavenworth. And uh, they remained at this location until July 9th. So uh, Ferguson documents his kind of daily, daily things. And uh, he says he traveled to Fort Leavenworth twice during that time. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, they weren't too far. Um, and then around 10 a.m., on July 9th, they headed out for the Santa Fe Trail. And so Ferguson in his journal also kept a, a table of distances from Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe in his diary. And his records show that the 3rd Regiment of the Missouri Mounted Volunteers were camped outside Fort Leavenworth on July 4th, 1847. And aside from the bath in Kansas, mm -hmm. he actually makes no mention of, of the celebration, okay. a national holiday. Um, being celebrated at all, which right. I, I think maybe it wasn't until around 1876 when we're like, we're 100, let's make it a big yes. deal. Yes. Kind of when we start maybe seeing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I kept reading because, um, again, Ken challenged me. <laughs> he said it's possible that one company might have, again, might have taken yeah. a different route. Absolutely. They could have separated. Yep. And so I'm still looking because at this point I'm thinking for Ferguson and Campbell and Clarkson are all in three separate companies. Mm -hmm. But my kind of conspiracy theory is that they're all traveling together sure. or very closely together. Yes. And uh, so on July 19th, so they've been out for about 10 days, Ferguson writes, lay by today at Cottonwood. The only timer here is the Cottonwood, the creek being skirted with pretty large trees mixed with small willows. On the opposite side, Three companies of our regiment are camped, Corpones, Bokes, and Clarksons. Having trains with them, they want to march with us, but the captain refused to do so, saying he wished to march faster than they could. <laughs> so, you know, it's really telling. He, he didn't just write down some facts. He was really sharing his own kind of observations of what was going on in his, his personality. So... Um, you know, it was real. when I read that, I was really excited because mm -hmm. it, it kind of further solidified the fact that, that Clarkson's company went from Leavenworth to the Santa Fe and mm -hmm. that way they, yes. they wouldn't have come down to, no. well, it, you know, again, Ken says that El Dorado, and you can tell on the map, it's not that far, but it's, it's 
too or, far for these yes, companies. Or military unit trying to get to the front as quickly as possible. From Leavenworth to El Dorado yes, to back up. Yeah, it wouldn't have. Made so, sense. exactly. So, um, so we can tell mm -hmm. once again from this timeline that um, it can be reasonably inferred that the story of J.J.W. or I'm sorry, I said his name wrong. Mm -hmm. J.W. Campbell. So many names, I'm getting them all confused. Mm -hmm. J.W. Campbell. His story of crossing the Walnut River a mile below El Dorado mm -hmm. on the fourth day of July, 1847, is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So whether the story was inaccurately reported by Miller, as told to him by Campbell, we do not know, mm -hmm. and that is unclear. Yeah, and you know, but it is interesting because you had shared again, kind of coming across some other newspaper mm -hmm. articles. Um, is this this Miller that we you know we mentioned? He was just mentioned in that first article as being the provider of this story to the paper. Yes. And um, and so doing a little more rabbit hole <laughs> uh, traveling, um, you know, we found out that it, this was 1876. Mm -hmm. And in 1875, the year before, had been a big kind of 99th uh, celebration. They were gearing up for that 100th year. And um, I think, was it in Roselia? They were having a, a big... Yes. A big picnic and they invited yeah. all mm -hmm. the surrounding yes. communities mm -hmm. to come and visit and uh, Captain Miller yes. who was an attorney he local, was an attorney uh -huh. was a guest speaker mm -hmm. so and he was waxing eloquently yes he was, what he was described as being well known for his storytelling I mean, I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. but he was well known for mm -hmm. his ability to tell a tale and you know I think that it's very possible mm -hmm. based on this first article that during maybe that event that Campbell would have a hey you know I I came around here mm -hmm. you know we you know we're we're talking about the first we want to we want to be the we want to yes. document our first because the nation is looking to, yes. to do some mm -hmm. of that um, this is where I was mm -hmm. and I was I was right around here when yeah. we celebrated the first fourth whether he actually told him that or just kind of relayed the story by the time it gets to the paper now yes it has grown a little yes. bit from from just what we look here at records and newspapers and journals from really primary sources and there was something you've told me previously and we haven't um talked much about it but um you found a source that to kind of describe the regiment encountering something called the walnut and then the great bend of the arkansas or arkansas or mm -hmm. kansas mm -hmm. and um I should say it properly, it's Art Kansas. I'm from Wichita, it's Art Kansas River. Um, and in that story, it's reasonably to be inferred if we did find that there is actually a Walnut Creek mm -hmm. that exists in Great Bend, and Great Bend happens to be on the Great Bend of the Arkansas River. Mm -hmm. So it's highly probable, this is my theory, mm -hmm. based on what you've shared and the information here, that um, Mr. Campbell, Elder Campbell, when he tells the story, he actually did cross a walnut mm -hmm. the walnut creek mm -hmm. and so it's easy it's possible that mm -hmm. in later years when he did move to butler county if he didn't wonder mm -hmm. um because maybe markers have changed and things mm -hmm. that I mean, many years have it's passed. been 30 years it's been 30 years mm -hmm. i don't know how i don't know how long he's lived in butler county right. at this point um it's very possible that he just put the memories together and thought well here's a walnut river Maybe mm -hmm. it is the walnut that we crossed, and and then that's part of where he started to get the tail. I mean, that's an assumption, mm -hmm. but it's also my theory. Hey, you know what? We like to uh, make kind of generalized guess, and yes. if you want to call it an assumption, yes. Dad used to say, well, we're going to beat that out. Yeah. But we're, <laughs> we're not going to assume. No. But we are going to do It's just, a working theory. Yeah, we're going to make some working theories, yes. and, and if they're wrong, we're going to disprove that. Yes. And if they're right, we're going to prove that, too. Yes. And in this case, even if, so I'm going to go with your theory here, mm -hmm. that he does remember crossing a walnut and, and you know, who knows, mm -hmm. it would have been after July 4th. True. Because he did he was still yeah, in Cottonwood on July yeah, 19th. That's true. Yeah. July 4th, he did cross a river. Mm -hmm. It was the Kansas. It was the Kansas. It was, and they, they did take a bath in it. They did, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or somewhere they took a bath. Yeah. So, uh, you know he might have been like oh yeah that was a holiday and we uh -huh. we did it right yeah right here in El Dorado yep <laughs> you know and we're just laughing because it is hard work tracking this stuff down it is it's difficult because sometimes we're following that we're following the lead Absolutely. just the way it is mm -hmm. and we're just hitting brick walls yes 
until we go, hmm, what if? And sometimes those what if questions really kind of open open up the, the big yes. picture. Yes, it's true. And if you hadn't found, if you had not found that little mention. Oh my gosh, that little, I was so excited that day to yeah. find Campbell and yeah. his little story. Because I. Uh, Otherwise we would not, we would still be hunting for Clark. Captain Clark. Captain Clark. There was not, not, there was not a Captain Clark. They had some private Clarks. Yep, but no Captain. Mm-hmm. No yep. private Clark from Greenfield, the same place yep. as Campbell. Yeah. Kind of makes sense. It does. It's true. <sighs> We have solved the first mystery. <laughs> the first, first, first event in Butler County, the first yes. 4th of July was not the first. Yeah. So that means there's still a first out there and there yes. is a story yes. that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to, you know, maybe address that one in, a, little, in another yes. episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so in, you know, as we celebrate 150 years of El Dorado, there are many firsts and there's many wonderful stories to tell and maybe a few scandalous tales we can tell in the future, mm -hmm. maybe perhaps. Some real outlaws. Some outlaws <laughs> for a pioneer town. Mm -hmm. So um, in celebration of the 150 years since the incorporation of the city of El Dorado on September 12, 1871, it is incumbent on us to ensure a truthful revision of our history is documented, published, and preserved. Absolutely, because that, that in the end, that's really the goal is is identifying what the truth of our history is and, and making sure that the people have access to that. Not yes. everyone maybe enjoys research. Right. I mean, I'm kind of a nerd. I enjoy it. Yeah. I like it. Same. Yeah. But not everyone no, likes everybody it. Does. No, and, and I've talked to, to people, friends, and who have said, you know, I would love to hear the story. They don't want to find out what the story is, but they really want to hear it. And mm -hmm. that kind of was... Kind of what prompted the um the reason for this podcast yes. and to share the story with people so we hope that you will join us next time while we hunt for history here on everyday el dorado i'm your host deanna vaughn i'm suzanne walenta and uh, i think if we want to do some further research on today's topic yes yeah. you can conduct it here at the butler county historical society um we are located at 383 east central and we can also be found at kansasoilmuseum.org. This program is a production of Everyday El Dorado in partnership with the Butler County Historical Society, home of the Kansas Oil Museum and the city of El Dorado, along with KBTL 88.1 The Grizz and is brought to you by our fine sponsors. All views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the individuals expressing them and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or positions of Butler Community College or KBTL 88.1 The Grizz, El Dorado, Kansas, Radio for Butler. That's a lot of work for a podcast. I think I understand.